Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 13 of my KSP campaign. We've got quite a lot to get through today, so I think we should just get started right off the bat. A number of these missions are of a type that you've seen before, so I'm going to kind of blast through them very, very quickly so that we'll get on to things that are a little bit more interesting. And what we have here is MapSat 2, finishing off its circularization burn, putting it into a 250 kilometer polar orbit. This is actually a companion satellite to MapSat 1, which is in a similar orbit. Uh, and you may recall a couple of episodes ago, after launching MapSat 1, I suddenly re recognized that I didn't have Kerbinite on uh, on it. I couldn't get it on the map, and the reason why I couldn't get... I keep saying Kerbinite, but it's actually carbonite. But anyway, the reason I couldn't get carbonite on my map was because I didn't have that mod installed. So I now have it installed and at the top here. We have the carbonite detector. I rather like the animation on this. It's kind of cute the way it keeps spinning around like that. And so this will allow me to detect um, carbonite on the surface of carbon. Now, carbonite, of course, is a fictitious substance, um, but they've scattered it all around the uh, KSP solar system and uh, in harvesting it you can then convert it to useful things like uh, rocket fuel and the like. So it will be a mod that will play in uh, future roles. Now I know that uh, one of the plans of KSP is actually to bring in its own resource gathering system so it'll be interesting to see what comes up when the game comes out of beta. I've also upgraded ScanSat to the latest version, so we have a little bit more of a slicker interface, and we can actually access that interface as well from uh, the KSP view, which is nice. Um, and uh, there's not much in the way of carbonite detecting, and in fact, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why I put carbonite around carbon. I think just to do it. Um, you know, what I'm, I'm, I don't, I can't ever see a situation where I'll be harvesting carbonite from the carbon's surface. You know, I'm much more interested in knowing where the carbonite is around other bodies like the moon or Minmus. And now we're a few days later and we're taking a look at JunkSat 8. Now the mission with JunkSat 8 is to get into a specific orbit around carbon and then to wait there for a little over 31 days. And you can see from uh, this satellite that I'm starting to unlock these a lot more of this small probe body stuff. Actually, one thing I do want to draw attention to that I haven't drawn attention to yet, if you look at the main body of the probe just above the battery, you will see what is a small radiator. That radiator is there to radiate heat. And that is necessary because of the interstellar mod. Now, the interstellar mod will start to play more of a role later on where uh, I start unlocking uh, some interesting technology that comes with it. But one of the things that it does do is it does model the heat that builds up on spacecraft. And heat is a real problem in real spacecraft. Um, people like to think, you know, they think of space as being really, really cold. In a lot of ways it is. But, you, you know, you're out there baking in the sun without any protection whatsoever, and parts do get hot. And space radiates heat very, very poorly. So you need radiators to try and manage and get rid of the excess heat that's coming up. And with interstellar, as in with real life, a lot of the heat is generated by the solar panels. So as soon as you get into these deployable solar panels, you do have to think about uh, radiating that heat away, away. And I find one of these small radiators uh, does the job if I only attach a couple of these smaller solar panels. As you get into bigger and more solar panels, you're going to need more radiators, and you'll see those later on. Um, now, the, the, the thing that happened here, though, is once I circularized my orbit, I noticed that I did not get the timer for the 31 days. So that was of a concern. Something has gone wrong. So, and and what I think happened, I ha while I was testing this guy, I got a I got a game crash while I was in the middle of doing a sim using the uh, Kerbal Construction Time mod. And I think somehow that messed this mission up. And yeah, that's pretty unfortunate. What gave me that idea? And then that idea got reinforced when I went over to another body and it gave me, or another spacecraft, and it gave me this message that 
I am currently in a simulation, and uh, that simulation hasn't ended yet. And, uh, you know, it gives me an option to build. So I played around a little bit and finally decided, you know, maybe the best thing to do is just to hit this build button. And that put another junk sat 8 into the building queue. And I thought, okay, you know what? Maybe that finally ended the simulation. So I'll wait for this second junk sat 8 to appear, and hopefully that will, and, and I'll put it into orbit, and hopefully that will finish off this contract. And the theme of mopping up past mistakes continues with JunkSat 9. Now, you might recall that JunkSat 7 uh, from last episode had a mission to uh, get into a specific orbit around the moon and remain there for a period of time, and I was caught unawares of the amount of Delta V it takes to get a capture uh, at a high altitude above the parent body. So this is JunkSat 9, here to do the same mission, this time packed with a couple of hundred extra uh, meters per second of delta V compared to the previous uh, JunkSat 7, and this time things go without a hitch, we get our orbit, and this mission is completed. Taking a look at the tech tree, you can now see that I'm up to the tier 6 nodes. I don't unlock anything here because I'm eyeing the high altitude flight and I don't have the science for that yet. But uh, I wanted to show this because I wanted you to notice that the next tier over is grayed out and that's because I haven't got the science facility upgraded enough yet. And to upgrade it to its next and final level is going to cost four million dollars which is quite a bit I'm right now only at about a million dollars so uh, it's gonna take a few more missions before that is um, before that is available that tier seven but that is my next objective that is the next thing I do want to unlock now having said that if you take a look along the tier six there is a lot on the tier six that we can still do and there's a lot of science I haven't even gotten to yet I've already uh, upgraded I've already got some 2.5 meter rocket parts and some uh, I've got the uh, the three-person command pod and you haven't even seen that yet and um, you know and I've yet to unlock things like the really big solar panels like the Gigantor ones we got the ion engines the plasma engines that come with uh, Kerbal Interstellar um, we got the nuclear engines coming up the nuclear generator so yeah a lot of stuff still coming up that you have yet to see and that's all just in tier 6 Finally, on to something a little bit new. This is the Kurjina Target Vehicle, or KTV. And the contract is to launch the Agena Target Vehicle. Um, this is part of the his one of the historical missions that comes with the Mission Controller 2 mod. And uh, this is actually a two-part mission. And the first part of the mission is to launch this vehicle, which is going to form a target vehicle for subsequent vehicles to, protect, uh, to uh, practice docking. Um, this is modeled after the Gemini missions. Uh, in the Gemini missions, there was an Agena target vehicle, and um, yeah, the mission was to just rendezvous with it. Now, the Gemini missions come from the 60s, and they were really sort of the precursor to Apollo, where um, the Americans were practicing um, working in space, doing long-term missions in space, doing rendezvous in space, doing EVAs in space, all the kinds of things that would be necessary for Apollo down the road, but doing them all in low Earth orbit. So here we have the Agena vehicle, it's got a docking port, and it's going to be ready to receive uh, a future docking mission. And now we move on to the Aristarchus, and I've lost track of how many missions the Aristarchus has flown. It's definitely become a bit of a workhorse, but at the controls here we have Manuki, even though you can't see her yet, but you'll see her pretty soon. And she's doing some of these aerial, um, air barometric pressure surveys. They're all done from the air, uh, which makes them pretty nice, but I started to notice that as I was flying north here, that uh, I was flying by, I'm, I'm, I'm on the west side of the Kerbin continent, and I could, and there's some deserts there just to the west of where I'm flying right now, and I thought, you know what, um, I have yet to pick up any science in the desert, and this thing is packed with a thermometer and a barometer and goo and, and, uh, and uh, materials base, so 
it would make sense for me to do a bit of a landing there um, just to get some more science. And with the benefit of four times speed, we'll scoop up this science nice and quickly. It was then a short jaunt to take off and to get myself back to the Kerbal Space Center. You do always want to end these missions when you can um, by landing back on the runway because then that way you get 100% recovery value and the only thing you spent is the cost of your fuel. Now we move on to the sixth mission of this video, with the main event still to come. Yes, nobody can say they don't get their money's worth here. So this is JunkSat 8 Redo. Yeah, I didn't even bother renaming the vessel this time. This is a carbon copy of the JunkSat 8 you saw earlier, attempting the exact same mission again. Remember that that mission somehow was glitched so that the timer that's, requ that's required for the mission uh, it wouldn't start, so I'm trying it again, and once again, the timer doesn't start. So this mission is seriously borked. There is something wrong with it. It is obviously impossible for me to complete it. If I cancel the mission, it comes with a pretty hefty penalty. Most of the Mission Controller 2 missions come with a very hefty penalty when you fail them. So... I felt justified to edit the save file. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I, I quit this game, I got into the save file, I edited it, gave me this bloody mission and the money and the uh, and the, the rep that came with it and counted this thing as complete. Now on to the final mission of this video. Housed underneath that giant fairing is the first module of the Hipparchus space station and the destination is going to be low carbon orbit. Now when you have awkwardly shaped vehicles like this one here, the strutting becomes really important. You can see the strutting there um, to try and stiffen this vehicle up and, and keep it flying true. And uh, one of the tips when it comes to strutting that I would always share with people, and this is just a basic thing of any kind of construction, is if you want to strut things and make things stiff, make triangles. That's the big thing. Try to always put these struts on bits of an angle. Try to create triangles. Um, and that makes things as stiff as you can make them. Now this fairing is the expanded 2.5 meter fairing, which is the biggest fairing I have right now. There's a bigger one coming up, but right now this is as big a thing as I can launch. And as this thing ascends, why don't we talk a little bit about who Hipparchus was. Hipparchus was a 2nd century BC Greek astronomer, considered by many to be the founder of trigonometry, um, though to be fair, many elements most elements of trigonometry can be traced all the way back to Babylon and to Egypt, uh, as well as to the Eastern world as well. Um, he's considered by many to be the greatest of the ancient astronomers. Uh, he is the first one to have surviving and accurate models of the motion of the sun and the moon. And using these models, he was able to accurately predict things like solar eclipses. Also using this model, he was able to discover the precession of the Earth's orbit, though saying the Earth's orbit is not quite right because of course they would think of the Earth as being stationary, so he discovered the precession of the equinoxes, that those equinoxes, the vernal and autumnal equinox, move in relation to the background stars. Uh, he constructed the first comprehensive star catalog in the Western world, and all of his work really became the standard for astronomers. Uh, the standard reference for astronomy uh, for the next few centuries right up to the time of Ptolemy. So why don't we pop the hood and take a look at what's inside here. Uh, one of the things, and probably my favorite things to do in Kerbal Space Program, is to uh, build stuff in space. I love building big things in orbit. Um, so I have to keep myself under some control. I have a tendency to spend more money than I need to. And as I mentioned earlier in this video, I do need to save up money. I need four, over $4 million to upgrade the science facilities. So I kept this thing to a minimum. Um, it's got, uh, as you can see, one of those hitchhiker uh, containers on it. Uh, it's got its ability to generate power. There's solar panels hidden in there that'll be opened up in a little bit. It's got life support enough to house um, three Kerbals for like, I don't know, 100 days or something like that. I'll have to take a look once I get some Kerbals out there. Right now, of course, the thing is unmanned. And the mission is to put this into 
orbit around Kerbin, so it's going to go into a low, er, uh, low Kerbin orbit. I'm going to aim for an altitude of 120 kilometers, um, and it needs to house five Kerbals, or have the ability to house five Kerbals, and you'll likely notice that right now, it, you know, the hitchhiker can can only house four Kerbals. So this by itself is not going to fulfill the requirements of the contract, but once I send up their a uh, 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 crewed vehicle to dock with it, it'll count the two things together and once those two things are together it'll look at the station and see that it can house more than uh, four Kerbals and will give me the contract. As I mentioned, uh, this thing is pretty minimalistic so I'm only considering it just to be the core of a future space station. Once um, I've upgraded the buildings that I feel like I need to upgrade it, I think I'll probably come back to this and go a little nuts with it and try to build it into something that's uh, a little bit more worthy to call itself a space station. And we're finishing off our final orbital insertion and then it's going to come time to uh, undock the transfer vehicle at the bottom here and uh, I want, the plan is to deorbit this but you know you gotta know that uh, I can't go too many missions in a row without something going wrong. So I go to undock this, and the thing that goes wrong is I have no control of the transfer vehicle. And the reason why I have no control of the transfer vehicle is because I forgot to raise its communitron. It's got a communitron hidden in there, and so this thing is, well, it's it's kind of dead. So I can't, I can't do anything with it. Now what's unfortunate is... Uh, I am coming up to a, a tech node which will upgrade all the probe cores so that when they're close to each other, like they are here, these are two vessels now very close to each other, they can communicate. They have built in antennas in the probe core, but I haven't upgraded yet, so yeah, that transfer vehicle is kind of dead. So I sat there looking at it going, okay, what am I going to do here? Uh, I thought, well, you know. Maybe the two will end up docking together again, but they won't unless, you know, they get far enough apart and then come back together again. I thought of, um, of, uh, of leaving this vehicle and coming back to it and maybe come back to dock, but that, that felt like I was sort of cheating, so I didn't want to do that. So I thought, you know, what would be best is to just kind of give this as a mission for the first Kerbals to come up here. So now the first Kerbals are going to come up here. They're going to have something to do. So I, I gave it a little nudge with the space station just to separate the two so that they won't end up somehow glitching together or something like that when I come back. And when I bring up my first crew for this space station, well, their first job is going to bring this transfer vehicle back to life. But that's going to have to be for a future episode. So that's going to conclude this one, and we hope to see you next time.